So with that, as I make an awkward squeak in the director's chair as I sit down, um, I'd love our panel to introduce themselves. So Bryce, Tanika Renee, please, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Tanika Renee, and I am a creator. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Bryce Adams. I work with a company called Captivate. We are a creator tech and managed service platform and proud partners with Stagwell. Happy to be here. So as I, as I said, one of the themes, and, and we saw this before with the, the excellent first panel, was about the trend lines towards advocacy. I thought there was a really interesting discussion about when, is it, when it's important for a brand to take a stance. What does that mean? What is taking a stance? Uh, Stagwell has research that shows that 60% of consumers, and the number is higher for younger consumers, want brands to take a stance on hot topic, hot button issues, but only if that brand is living up to its core values. Um, consumers are getting more perceptive. They're getting more, some might say, skeptical of these corporations. And so brands that get this type of action wrong face serious financial and reputational headaches. So I wanted to start, Tanika, why is it important why is it important for brands to participate in advocacy when they do? Um, so I'm one of those creators who doesn't consider herself a creator. I'm like, Ugh, I just create content that I'm passionate about. I'm not an influencer. Um, so when I work with a brand, I feel like, well, I'm big on community. So when I work with a brand, I feel like I'm bringing that brand to the living room table. They're coming to dinner. So this brand is, I'm welcoming you into the family. And what you stand for and what you're doing has to align with my family. What was the question? <laughs> I mean, I think that was a great answer. Why is it important that these brands participate in advocacy when they choose to? Um, because you're, you're, I'm introducing you to my family. So what you stand for has to represent my family. It's got to, you got to think about it as an always on. You talk about it being a core value to who you are. And you think about like the beauty and personal care space and the challenger brands that are coming out there and the brands that really stand on something that's like positive socioeconomically or for a pro-social base, whether it's like a donation of some sort, whether it's some sort of ethically source or uh, sustainable source materials. So it's very easy for them to show up in the right way when things go wrong. And you see a lot of your legacy, you know, large scale portfolio beauty personal care companies are seeing their bottom lines being hit by brands that are more purpose driven. And so then when you try to jump into a conversation, um, you don't really have permission to make a stand or, or take a statement. So I think it's a general principle in life. Like, Anybody can talk, but you really have something to say. And that really is backed up by kind of what you're known for as a brand, you know, the way that you align your values with your consumer, which is what you're talking about when you try to bring into a third party advocate, which is what creators are, right? You're tapping into them, their audience, their experience, you know, their life story to reach an audience of people that feels very similar to them. Um, so it can just go really wrong really quickly if it's not something that you're constantly focused on as opposed for waiting something to, bad to happen to be like, oh, this is our chance. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think that brings up sort of a great way of sort of how we vet these brands and do we take their word for it when they say, we're a good company, we believe in X, Y, Z, that, that sounds good. You know, I think we've seen a lot of brands that have that sort of say, do gap, right? Where they're always saying how great they are, but sometimes are either not doing what they're saying they're doing or are actively doing things that are contrary to that advocacy message. So Bryce, the creators you work with, and then I'd love Tanika as a creator to, to go into this more uh, in more depth, how do creators appropriately vet while balancing the fact that you are a professional, you're an entrepreneur, you gotta make money. Uh, so what do you think? I mean, I would say as a best practice, one of the reasons why the rise in populator, or popularity of creators kind of across the board is because it really kind of started with me advocating for things that I use in my everyday life, things that I'm passionate about. I'm sharing that with like my community. And so, you know, a lot of creators, I think as a whole, and when Tanika talks about 
the values her audience shares with her and she invites them to the dinner table, it's like one of the reasons they come and show up every night is because they know that you have done some sort of uh, like vetting it yourself, yeah. you support the brand, whether it is efficacy, whether the mission behind it, whether the value, there's something about it that you want to share. Um, and so I think that really is the best way to do it. But, you know, we talked about challenger brands and there's a lot of brands out there that have quality product that maybe haven't had the reach and they're maybe approaching someone like you who's got an established audience and established track record of having, you know, fortune 500 brand collaborations. Um, I think it is things about, again, what would draw you to the product? Maybe thinking about it from a personal level and not saying what's going to work with my audience. I think there's probably some considerations there, but it's like, is it going to work with my hairstyle? Is it going to be something that I feel like the customer service is what I expect when I go to spend my own money? Um, and so we try to talk to creators about that because you don't want your feed to look like a NASCAR hood. Anybody can take any deal, um, but that's going to drive down engagement. It's going to drive down trust. It's going to drive down loyalty. It's going to lead to less results. It's going to put you out of business. So my motto is all money is not good money. So I, I really, I'll go on a brand's platform and I want to make sure that I see diversity. Um, you know, I'm seeing what the brand's culture is. I'm, I'm Googling, I'm researching, um, you know, I'm going to the group chats. Um, I'm asking like, what do we know about this brand? Um, did you hear anything? I'm Googling scams, I'm Googling whatever I can find. Um, and recently, I had a collaboration with, well, a partnership with a hotel. Um, hotel was based in Jamaica. Um, beautiful, beautiful property. And, you know, I, I was excited. As a Jamaican, I was excited. And I post the hotel, and I get all these messages about how locals are not allowed to stay at the hotel. And, um, you know, like, I didn't even know. I, I did my research, and I didn't hear anything about this. Um, and I had to go to the PR company that reached out, and, you know, I'm, I had to make a decision. Um, and I also learned, too, that I needed to put something in the contract to protect myself. You know, when I'm working with brands, if something pops up, because brands have that in their contract. You know, if I do something wrong, um, they can void out the contract. So I, I realized that, but I also realized that as a creator, you know, sometimes brands are going to hide that. They're going to hide. And this was a recent thing, and I could not find it. Um, I had to, you know, make a statement to my audience stating that I did not know about it. And then I also had to confront the brand and say, okay, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna move forward? Because again, this is my family and I don't want to offend my family. You know, I want authentic partnerships and I have members in my family who are from everywhere. <laughs> and, you know, I don't want them getting denied to go to a hotel. I have a question because we talked about it from kind of our perspective and there's like crisis comms, which is like, you know, hopefully what we try to avoid to the best we can, but from like an assembly perspective, the expect the extent that you can, how do you guys have these discussions with your partners? Well, having worked in crisis comms before I started at assembly, uh, well, so one of the things we do, my, my day job uh, is I help run our political practice, right? So we're planning and, and executing media strategies for campaigns from dog catcher all the way up to president uh, across the country. <laughs> um, what we've done is we've taken a lot of that sort of specific information, insights, that niche know-how, and we've started to apply it to our corporate clients, our brand clients, because a lot of times people don't realize it, but they need a small p political media strategy. They need to be able to respond fast when something doesn't go according to plan, whether it's a crisis communications issue or not. Uh, they need to be able to be nimble uh, and targeted. Uh, the entire structure of our team versus you know, what you might think of from a media agency is, is different because of that. Um, you know, we've basically in-housed a lot of those processes. So we're, you know, instructing our clients, if they listen to us, which obviously all of the clients in this room always listen to everyone at Assembly, and we appreciate that. Uh, but what we, what we tell them to do is honestly be yourself. I, I come from the political campaign world, and the easiest thing to do is tell the truth. 
Um, mm -hmm. Some politicians don't understand <laughs> that or choose to ignore it, but it's the easiest thing. But Tanika, I want to go to something you said where it's we're talking about responsibility from the corporation side, but it sounds like you feel a responsibility. And if you're inviting everybody to your dinner table, as you said, and it's bad food, you got a problem. <laughs> and honesty is the best policy. Um, you know, I've learned that in order for me, because I'm very big on being authentic and being yourself and communication and and I have to do, I have to almost over communicate. And um, so when I'm working with a brand and a brand does not communicate to me, then I have to pick up the pieces and then I have to over, even more over communicate to my family. I mean, I think that's great. And I think there are certainly some you know, mega multinational corporations that could benefit from thinking in that way like a creator. So to Bryce, I guess the question is, to, to, go, to build off of that, as we shift more into a creator economy, as, you know, I know influencers can sometimes be a bad word, but as influencers become a bigger and bigger part of a, of a media strategy, does that responsibility angle, does the burden get passed to the influencer or does it still rest with the corporation? I think it's a shared responsibility. If you're talking about a partnership, then that means like two ways. And so, you know, I remember having had a campaign and some creator's sister was on some show that has 17 kids and, you know, the creator's sister had made some sort of third-party reference to something that probably wasn't brand safe. And like those are the things, that's just regular people. We've got, you know, all got our cousins that may have different <laughs> viewpoints. Like we, that's just regular stuff. But I think that like, and, and Tanika referenced it, it's if we really want to connect with people, you know, you can call it the creator economy, the attention economy, whatever it is, it's hard to get somebody to notice. And it's even harder to get them to be loyal, follow and be loyal. And so you have that responsibility as that shepherd to this audience to kind of help pre-vet. But nobody's going to be perfect, you know. I think there's a lot of people, there's constantly a delicate balance of what's funny, what's insensitive, you know, what's, what's allowed, what isn't. When the, um, you know, Israeli conflict, you know, really ignited about eight weeks ago, we had brand partners that turned off all of their messaging. It was like, hey, tell everybody, don't post anything, which, you know, is a very small concession to make just to be on the safer side. Like, you know, it, are you going to find it offensive if someone's posting about diapers? I mean, maybe, maybe not, but it's like we probably should just take the high road and just not say anything for a while and let's recalibrate. And so I think when you have a really good partnership with anything, whether it's a marriage, a brand deal, a, a, a colleague situation, like communication, I think just like shared accountability is important. And I think those are the things that grow one-off uh, relationships with creators to always-on opportunities with creators to more affiliate-led relationships with creators. So if we're really thinking about growing that relationship, that kind of symbiotic communication is very important throughout the whole process. I agree because my sister's crazy and I've called her out on my <laughs> I've called her out a couple of times on my page. Listen, that's my sister. I have nothing to I love her, but <laughs> I, I think that was a really interesting point you brought up uh, with the, the diapers and, and sort of the, the geopolitical issues and how that makes us because I remember a couple years ago we had a core client who we were talking to about things like this and and they said we don't want to be anywhere around political issues. And this was October of 2022. And I was like, okay, well, you have two choices. You can go dark, but you're not going to make your holiday season uh, goals. Or you can learn how to coexist. We live in a democracy. Like, there's going to be political uh, going on. Probably 10 to $12 billion this year. So it's, I, I think it's, it's good to, to see that brands are starting to realize that, like, brand safety doesn't do anything for you when you can't build a brand because you've gone dark for the last six months. I and mean, I think that's a, important to kind of touch on. You're right, just the balance of getting the job done, but also making sure that you are showing up in the right way. And this year is a really interesting case study because we have the Olympics, you know, and there's a lot of, to your point, geopolitical turmoil out there. And there's probably going to be moments that are going to happen. And, you know, somebody's going to have to figure out how do we respond to that. Um, it's an election year, so you're turning the corner on that, and that's going to be really divisive around 
one, just breaking through the clutter and how do we actually, you know, when everyone's talking about, especially we have one candidate who really knows how to dominate a news cycle. So there's gonna be a lot of talk around that. And like, how do we play off that? And I think there are some people who, like Wendy's on Twitter can get away with making a joke because like that's how they've always been and it'll probably be funny. Um, you know, Bank of America probably can't make too many political jokes on Twitter. It's not gonna turn out well for them. And that's where we have to, like your job to shepherd your clients through that is very similar to Tanika, just in a different kind of way. And I think to Tanika, that's a great, a great lead in. How do you tell when a company's full of shit? <laughs> a lot of them are, but um, you can just feel it. Um, and then also it, it's, it's really like I, I look at, I go on their social media, I look at the comments. Um, I, I take a, it depends because you have smaller brands where I can actually see who the owner of the company is and see what they, I, that's as a creator, I'm looking at the owner, I'm seeing what they stand for. And then you have bigger um, companies, bigger brands where now I'm looking at the culture and I'm seeing who their followers, what the comments are. Um, when things happen, I want to know what's going on. Like I personally, I want to see where the brand stands. And if they're quiet, why are you quiet? Because to me, it's like if you're silent, silence is you're still taking a stand. You're taking a position. So it, as a creator, I have to be very, very careful. Like I need to, I'm deep diving because my followers, my family, they're going to check me. They are going to call it out and they're going to ask questions. They're going to say, oh, why are you working with this brand if they feel this way when you feel the opposite? Well, I'm going to say the word crap right now so Duncan can dub <laughs> it in after over, uh, over the last thing I said. Uh, but I, it, an interesting thing I've been looking at in, in really, a, frankly, a sad and depressing turn of events is these incorrect assumptions and, and performative advocacy issues have gone from being you know, potentially damaging to a brand's bottom line to potentially physically harmful to influencers and to content creators and, and to people who get caught up in this doom loop of political that, that we or this situation we've gotten ourselves into. So now that we've shifted from, again, having just, okay, there's, you have a, a bottom line issue as a brand to you could get someone hurt or worse, how important is it or how much more important is it to really do that vetting both from a creator side, but also from a brand side to say, is this really an issue we want to discuss? And if it is, how do we ensure brand safety, but also partner safety? So I think, so we're in a year of 2024 where it's big on community, it's big on authenticity. And so when you're, nothing's performative about what I do. Like when I'm sharing my content, when I'm sharing my life, this is me. Like I am not putting on, I am not following trends. I'm showing the good, the bad, and the ugly. So when I can't work with a brand who it's performative, like what you stand for has to be real. What you're doing has to be real. And I have to be able to see that and look through that and if not, then my family will see that and they would say, okay, you're not an authentic brand. Like, we can't follow you anymore. Or if I do something, then you have the opposite and you have the people who are on social media who hate creators, they hate influencers, and they're looking for you to do something wrong because they want to call it out, call it out and they don't want you to win. So... You, it's like you, you have to be so careful who you work with. You have to vet them. And as brand, on brand's end, you have to really align yourself because if you're aligning yourself with the wrong creator, then it's performative. I mean, I think the problem in this country, and I'll get off my campaign speech. This country. Is there's not enough middle ground in anything. You know, there's just not enough middle. Everything has been, everyone's on such one side or the other. Um, and it feels like a lot of times you worry about the negative backlash of something that could happen online. 
I think the other thing that we don't think about or talk enough or maybe plan for enough is what if the audience you're trying to reach responds negative to it? And it's not, you know, people who are anti-change or anti-DNI or anti-whatever, but if I'm trying to speak to a certain community and um, the African-American community and it comes across and you offend them. And so, you know, how do we prevent that as well? And so I think the problem, because there's not enough middle ground and you feel like you might be pandering, you can't just come in and, and, and consumers aren't really willing to say, I understand what you're doing there. Maybe it was a miss, but there is a lot of backlash at times and it happens online. If you work in the online space, you know, now you've got tens of millions of impressions, you know, bashing me or talking or trending about this person or whatever the case may be. And so I think that um, if you're thinking about planning again, it comes to kind of what you were getting at was intentionality and being very intentional about what's our overall content calendar. How do we make sure that we're having messages that are going to be um, received well by people throughout the year so that when you want to double down, it feels like it's again, it's a right time for us to have something to say in this moment because we've been kind of building this crescendo and we've been to your point, educating and building community and, and things like that being and being authentic yes. throughout the whole time. And I think that's actually one of the cool things that creators or whatever social media allows you to do is like, you know, you can show up if you do it and plan it in the right way in a meaningful way to a Latino community. You can show up in a meaningful way to an African American community, to a mom community, to a teenager Gen Z. Whereas, you know, if you were just buying TV 30 years ago, you were one way. You just came across that one way your ads. And maybe you bought on some different ne networks and swap. Remember the McDonald's? You'd swap out the same commercial as different racial people. You know, that's like how you would show up. Well, now you have the ability to show up in different ways on different platforms through different mediums if you really are intentional about how you want this to come across all the time, not just one of the time or some of the time. I think sometimes a lot of brands forget that creators are human. Like, we're real people. Um, we have feelings. Um, we, we make mistakes sometimes. Um, and I feel like, like, I love social media. This is the first time, like, as a black woman, I am able to create my own narrative. I'm, I'm able to show up as myself authentically. And, you know, I, I, feel the most comfortable that I've ever felt in my life. And it's so empowering. Um, and I know, I'm sure there's so many people who, you know, feel the same way. And then it's like, you, I feel like when you're collaborating with a brand and that brand um, misleads you. And, you know, I'm here sharing my narrative and I have, my audience that's um, you know enjoying, and you know they're inspired by it, and I partner with a brand who misleads me and doesn't disclose, you know their past history. That's going to the whole inspiration, all the work that I've just done. It's going to ruin it. It's going to ruin my brand deals. It's going to ruin my money. You know, I'm providing for my family the first time I'm able to create my own income and provide for my family. Like there's so, I feel like there's such a responsibility that we overlook and we don't think about. Well, especially in a situation where social media has sort of, you know, taken away the veneer of like, you know, this corporate monolith that has, you know, 40 levels before you mm -hmm. could be heard. I mean, you know, Bryce mentioned Wendy's, great example. Um, if you're not following the state of New Jersey on Twitter, you have to. <laughs> it is incredible. Um, but I do want I don't want this to be all doom and gloom because there are brands that successfully navigate this space. I mean, the low hanging fruit is Patagonia. It's a wonderful brand. They have a, a core value, a, a core set of values that sort of leads there and and sort of guides their advocacy. And it sounds like that's the most important way to avoid performative advocacy, mm -hmm. avoid the brand safety issues, uh, and, and everything that comes along with that. It's it's taking your core values and saying, well, you know how we feel about this issue. We're going to put our money where our mouth is. Exactly. And and so I guess 
you know, there, there are a number of brands that, that come to mind, but in addition to that, what is the best way that a brand can, can start? Because I think that's the problem is we start in this place where a brand says, all I know is I don't want to get involved. I, I, it's a political issue. I, I don't want to be involved in it. But then a lot of them go, well, our employees all feel climate change is a significant issue. Our consumers feel climate change is a significant issue, a significant issue. but it's political. What's the first step? Well, I think the first step, mind you, I'm a creator, but I think the first step is what is the brand's identity? Like, I feel like, um, you know, brands, we're, we're in an era right now where the economy isn't so great. So every now and then, like, a brand might panic and say, hey, you know, let's, let's do this or let's do that. But does it align with the brand identity? Because when I'm doing my research and seeing if it aligns with my brand's identity, I'm basing it on what's out there. So now when you want to go left, then I didn't know that you went left your, your last two campaigns. And I'm looking, okay, this was your core value, but two, cam two campaigns ago, you were left. So I don't know that. So now when I work with you, then I end up misleading my audience. So I think a brand has to stick with their brand identity, their core values. They also have to determine what that is. I think it's um, a couple of things. I think one, just recognizing that there's a gap is just a huge step as opposed to just like, oh, we'll just leave that over there. We'll, you know, Just recognizing you need to do something and then you, you, know, you put together a plan from there. I think the other thing is like, you know, as younger people, it's becoming really a big part of, you brought up climate change, for example. They're, they're very much active in that way and they appreciate brands that are, again, kind of giving back in some sort of way in that way a lot more than I think our generation ever was. So we don't have to wait for those folks to all get jobs, but as they get more buying power, I think people, it'll be, you know, the way we were at DNI 30 years ago or whatever, like you'll just start to see an increased shift on that. And anytime you're providing value to your consumer, that's good for you. So that value could be, you know, through an experience, that value could be through the way you sustainably source, that value could be through the way that you just recognize that I connect with you on one on a level where we both recognize something is wrong. Um, you know, my daughter's six and she talks about things that are bad for the earth all the time because for her, it's just something that she learned about it in school and she's really concerned. You know, it was like climate change is a, a pie in the sky idea when I was in first grade 35 years ago. Um, but, you know, for her, it's like, it's here. Um, and so I think, you know, being good corporate citizens is good for business. And I think it manifests itself in a lot of different ways. And I would think that like the, everyone has some sort of intention to stand for something and have solid core values and connect with consumers in some way. But it becomes performative when you try to show up in a space where you should not be. Exactly. Or it's it's like you take a brand. I don't want to say what brand it is, but it's like there's a brand that is like their their um you know their their latest campaign is um, sustainability, but you know it's fast fashion, and you know it's it's like your fast fashion. You're really not sustainable. So it's like it's performative <laughs> and um and it's a lot of brands that do that so to me it's like you, you're just hopping on a trend and it's not authentic one of the fascinating things to me because i'm a nerd and like looking at this kind of data but uh rainbow washing is fascinating to me because come june you will see brands that you know oh, yeah. change their profile picture to a pride flag well because I'm a nerd, I'm on Open Secrets. I'm on the FEC looking at what super PACs this brand oh, yeah. donated to over the last year or two. And very often, it is not ones that necessarily go with their, their theme of being inclusive on Pride Month. Um, mm -hmm. One thing, I, I want to be conscious of time, and, and I definitely want to open it up to, to questions. Um, I've seen a lot of active listening, so I'm sure there's a ton of questions. Yes? What occurs to me is that there's a, a disconnect between um, boards of directors, trustees, stakeholders of companies, and the, the creators of their marketing strategies and their audiences. Um, and it feels as though there isn't enough accountability, or what do you think about whether or not there's any accountability 
um, to the the stakeholders, right? So if your board of trustees is 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 thinking politically in a very specific way, right? Like, to what degree is um, are they being um, kind of conscientized to the direction that the brand wants to go, or the direction that the, that their consumers are are leading them towards? Because you know, consumers are essentially voting with their money, right? So now the board of trustees and the stakeholders have have a duty to be conscientized and educated. Is that not? I think that's a phenomenal question or comment, a phenomenal point to make, right? Because the answer is it is difficult for these brands to do it. And I'll add to that, not just the consumers or voters, but we have seen extreme amounts of employee advocacy at some of these really large companies where the employees are challenging the direction uh, of the way things are going. So I think you add that to the fact that, you know, your consumers want you to go a certain way, your employees want you to go a certain way, and now we're, we're maybe with a select group of people who aren't necessarily representative of the world or representative of their consumers or employees. And again, that's, it's a danger zone for brands. And it's, it's, it's about money. <laughs> you know, even as creators, like a lot of times we take money, rent, rent comes on the first, and it's like, you know, this brand <laughs> reaches out, and I'm like, oh, that's rent, <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it doesn't align, and, you know, it's like, do I pay rent, or do I take this, you know, do I take this and pay rent, or, you know, it's, it's, it's hard, like, we're all trying to figure it out, but not all money is good money. <laughs> if anyone's on the board of directors of a Fortune 1 to 300 brand and wants someone to do it, you can hire me right now. <laughs> I, will, I will be the guy to do it. No, um, I mean, you, you like summarize it so well. There's just not enough diverse representation throughout your organization, and that goes into intentionality, and there's a huge, obviously, struggle with that, and states banning those sorts of things, and, you know, that's another time, topic for another, another uh, panel. But I think, you know, that's when it shows up when you don't have that internal advocacy, you don't have those internal voices that you can trust. Um, and I think, again, it just starts with just everyone recognize, all right, well, this is, a, this is a, a gap that we just have not solved for. And we really should be thinking about it because it is good for business. Those numbers are going to reflect that. Um, and if you do it the right way, I think you can make an impact. You can sell more stuff. You can be proud of the work you're doing with your kids. You can do all of it. You don't got to boil the ocean. Just figure out, you know, how do we start? And when you talk about that kind of two-way relationship that you have or the way that you evaluate the monetary value versus the opportunity to kind of stay in the, in the lane that you're most comfortable with, it's the same thing that's happening on, on Park Avenue. So. Absolutely. Uh, any other questions? I actually have something to add to that. I know I'm not on this panel, but... <laughs> Celebrity guest I joining know. at the last Here minute. I am with my this is the big reveal. Event. Yeah, so I, I spent the beginning of like the first part of my career working with brands, and Tampax was one of my clients. And Tampax was created to essentially bring women into the workforce, like get them out of the home so that they can actually like go out and do the things that they set out to do. And when there were reproductive health Oof. issues that were on the line. Oof. Tampax made a point, because they knew they stand for women, they made a point to actually do something and speak out against the atroci atrocities that were happening. And so I think that it's, you know, they did that understanding that they would alienate a huge group of people, but they were like, you know what, this is what we believe in, we're going to do it. We don't care if our shareholders, you know what I mean, if they come back and they're like, oh, we're not going to buy Tampax because they're too woke, that is something that actually happened. Um, our creative ended up getting pulled off the air in different countries because we took a stand on, on different women's issues. And so I think that brands also have a responsibility to live up to their heritage, like what they, you know, mm -hmm. they, need to, they need to tap into basically what got them into this industry or whatever industry it is and stick to it, you know? Like, be a true advocate for your consumers. Your consumers are looking to you as this brand that's been around for hundreds of years to be on the side of right. And so, you know, they have to do and, it. And to add on that, Tampox created a community. Yes. And it's like, it, and I think that's what caused the longevity. Because when you create a community, 
whether you're a creator or you're a brand, you can outlive any trend. Yes. Yeah. And and just more on my experience. Um, <laughs> No one asked for, um, but uh, I, I had a client while um, while I was working on a, a lot of the PNG business. He used to refer to me as her multicultural muse. So I won't really comment on that language because a little problematic. But <laughs> what I what I appreciated from her was that she knew that she didn't have the lived or learned experience to be able to communicate to groups of consumers in you know in a certain way so she was like i want to reach i want to reach the black community i want to reach black women how do i do that though i'm not the an authority on all black women i was still able i was that voice in the room who was able to tell them that what they were looking to do may not be received in the way that they want it there was a, a, a lot of other advice that we would give the brands too like you can't have these love them and leave them relationships you can't be like okay it's pride i'm gonna throw up a flag or it's Black History Month. I'm about to. I'm gonna do some black stuff right now, and then they never hear from you again. You know, so it's really important to make sure that you are fostering that community, and you know, doing that on an ongoing basis, and not have these love them and leave them activations. I think that is just a phenomenal point. That's why Bria is in charge. Um, <laughs> but I think that's a phenomenal point, and it brought up something I was thinking about from a political client perspective. Um, really, in the last two to four years. The shift has gone from Spanish language advertising to specific cultural Spanish language advertising. Because forget the creative messaging might be different for Hispanics in Florida versus yeah. Hispanics in Texas. The languages may be different and the words that are used may be mm -hmm. different. And so it was this just sh shock that went over a lot of campaigns that were underperforming and the question was, well, we have this growing percentage of the population, but their, their voting statistics are not backing up them being a growing percentage of the population. And it was because they were not being spoken to, they were being spoken at. And, and I think that that is something, again, you know, to bring it back to the beginning of applying some of these, you know, I kind of hate that the word political is in my title, because much like when I did crisis comms, kind of feels like you're in trouble if you have to see me. Uh, but it, it is one of those areas where politics and looking at things from a campaign practice can actually be beneficial to your brand without saying, we endorse candidate A over candidate B. I'm actually gonna go on the piano and do a little set for you guys, a little stand up later, maybe joining the Black Keys at 10 p.m. tonight, who knows. Uh, thank you to our wonderful, wonderful oh, panelists, Tanika, Bryce. Thank you all for being here and thank you, Bria.